All right, uh, so let's just dive in here. This is Derek Kirby joined again with Saad Youssef talking some Mavericks basketball. Obviously, things have not been going super smooth the last few days. The Mavericks are in a murderous stretch of the season, have really just the worst luck as far as health and safety protocols and how many guys they've had out. And it's putting them in a rough spot where now they're a game below 500. I think it's the first time I saw the other day I can't remember who to accredit it to that I saw it post on Twitter, but it's like the first time in like 22 months that they've dropped three straight games. Is that, does that ring any bell or anything to you? No. Yeah. I don't, I don't know exactly who tweeted that first, but that is a, that is a factual statement. The Mavericks were the only team in the NBA last year that never lost three games in a row. Wow. Yeah. So this is a, this is a little bit of uncharted and not the, the good way territory here. Uh, they're, they're in a rough spot for sure. I mean, they're, they're in, I mentioned a murderous row of games in this week. It's like a stretch of five games in seven days. Obviously there are a couple in now and to have anywhere from four to six players out throughout the entirety of this has been just brutal. And you're losing games that health permitting, you're not losing. Like you're in a situation where you almost take down a, a good Milwaukee team, despite being way shorthanded. And then now you've stacked up a couple bad losses with Chicago and a Raptors team. That's not the same Raptors team as last year by any means. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, like you said, it's, it's, an, it's unfortunate. I, I, I tweeted this last night while I was watching the Mavs game. And, and I said, you know, I look forward to the day when, when talent and execution once again is deciding sports games and not, um, not who was able to avoid this super, uh, super easy to contract virus. Um, so, you know, the Mavericks are really shorthanded and, and that's really unfortunate, uh, especially when you go have a murderer's row of schedule, like they're in the middle of right now. I mean, this is, this is just a really, really tough stretch for them and they really just need to get out of it, you know, without dipping too far under 500 or anything like that. Yeah. It, I mean, like I said, it's five games, seven days. They've had, I think, probably the hardest schedule so far from I, I saw it somewhere posted. It was either the hardest or the second hardest schedule thus far in the season. So to be going into this stretch shorthanded, but you know, with, with everything else, you're shorthanded. It's the worst stretch of the year and you're having the worst luck of arguably any team in the league thus far dealing with the virus. I mean, that, that just is a perfect storm for, you know, putting you really behind the eight ball early on in this season as they're now six and seven and what's already a little bit shorter than usual of a end of an NBA season. So hopefully they can get back on track with some of these guys coming back. Brunson has returned to the lineup. I think Richardson and Dorian Finney Smith are both close as well. Correct. Yeah, I believe so. And, and also just to add on to your fact real quick, there is, you know, I hate to say this and I wish it, it wasn't true, but it's, it, it's just a fact of the world that we live in right now the Mavericks have been hit by this virus pretty hard. And yes, they, you know, they're, they've gotten off to a rough start in the season. There's just no telling which team in the Western conference that they're competing with. At what point does this happen to another team? And they go through a, a, uh, a struggle in the schedule. So that's the other thing of this whole context of like, you know, when you, when you talk about where the Mavericks are falling in the, in the rankings and the pecking order of the Western conference, you just don't know which other teams are going to have to deal with the stuff later on that the Mavericks are dealing with right now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it's, it's uncharted territory, like I said. So yeah, it's uh, they're going to have to figure out something because they're a team that while they are very improved defensively this year, the offense hasn't been the same as what we saw last year, last year, they were, I mean, we know about the most scoring off uh, most efficient scoring offense in NBA history, but last year they were number three overall in scoring offense. It's not been nearly so high this year. I think they're averaging something around 109 a game approximately. And it's like, it's great that you have the defense and that's there all the time. But when you're depleted and some key players there, you know, Richardson, a guy that you were expecting to come in and challenge to be, if not that de facto third guy, at least a, uh, a switch off kind of third guy between him and Hardaway Jr. You're missing him. You're missing then some some of that defensive help as well, and a guy that can stretch the floor as well with Maxi. So it's it, it's very difficult to manage that, regardless of who you're having to go against. But 
I see uh, a tweet here from Bobby Crell on Twitter talking about in the Mavericks wins, their offensive rating is 113.2 and their defensive ratings are 95.6. But in their losses, it's only 102 offensive rating and a negative 13.9 net rating for the defense. Uh, sorry, that's the difference. It's a negative. Uh, it's 115.9 for the defensive rating. It's a difference of negative 13.9. So it's very, very, uh, I think, clear looking at how this team uh, has to balance the two ends of the floor a little bit. And it's, it can't get too high or too low on either side. Yeah. And that was the whole point of adding Josh Richardson, right? It was, it was not because all of a sudden the identity of this team was going to become a defensive identity. No, it was, it was more of like what you just said. It's creating that balance. Whereas with Seth Curry, you had a guy who, you know, was going to be an added asset to the offense and help score all of those crazy numbers that you rattled off a little, uh, just a little bit ago. But with Josh Richardson, you thought you were going to get a defensive upgrade and a guy offensively that sure, he wasn't going to shoot the lights out like Seth Curry did, but he could still shoot. Um, you know, the, 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 the one thing I will say when it comes to the defense, Luka Doncic, um, you know, you, you just have to talk about him because, because I think we all wanted, we all hoped that Luka would be able to just not be a liability on defense. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody expected for him to become a strength on the defense. And that's, that's literally what Luca has become this season. And it's been uh, honestly quite ridiculous to watch in, in some games, just how good he's been with the steals and getting in the passing lanes. Um, like, like, you know, if you just look at the box scores, that's one thing. But if you're actually watching these games, you're watching Luca in real time, reading these opposing teams. You can see him make breaks on the ball, um, read what other players are doing. And I think that's been, if you want to look at a positive, that is one thing that's been a really big plus is that Luca has gone from being a liability to not just being in the middle, but now being an advantage on the defense. And it's something that the Mavericks can definitely build off of. Yeah, absolutely. That's been for the, for the Mavericks the biggest positive and the thing that I think has really anchored down the the defense in that regard. Like it, it's as you said, we came in just hoping that with the adjustments that we made that he wouldn't be a liability or that you could at least hide him to the degree that he might be, and he's instead turned into one of your best defenders in this case, uh, and and that's tremendous. We talked about how he was going to work on his shooting in the off season. He's definitely added a mid range game, which is very nice to see. I like that a lot. Even see him breaking out the Dirk one legged fade from time to time, the statue shot. That's awesome to see, but the defensive growth as well, it has been great. It, it seems like you can never get uh, a game where he's both shooting threes and free throws. Well, it's almost like a one or the other, take your pick. But if he's got the mid range game working, then he doesn't have to rely as much on the three point shooting although he's had a couple decent games in that regard as well. I think he's had like a five of nine a couple games ago from three. So that Chicago game was just an inferno in the first half. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you talk about the mid range game, I think with, with Luca, it should, it, it's surprising, but it also shouldn't be surprising because part of, part of what his approach to the game is when, 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 the, whether it's another team or the league is zigging, he's zagging. Right. So, everyone's moving away from the mid range. What happens when everyone goes away from the mid range is not only are other offenses not doing it, but that means other te defenses aren't defending it as often and are kind of either sleeping on it or have forgotten how to defend it. And you see that a lot. If you watch the Clippers, right? Because mm -hmm. Kawhi Leonard is, is a very effective mid range player. And the, and I mean, honestly, like, I mean, I watch a, uh, I watch a ton of NBA basketball and I watch a lot of Kawhi Leonard. Um, it, it still blew me away in that playoff series, how much he was, how much he was working the mid range game against the Mavericks in the bubble last year. And I think Luca kind of probably saw that and was like, Hey, there's, there's something here where, you know, if I'm able to just, you know, work this a little bit and, and add this to my repertoire, then I don't have to be jacking up step back threes and I don't have to go take all the punishment all the time, even though I do think that driving and dishing or driving and finishing is still his best offense. Um, he doesn't have to do it all the time. He can stop on a dime, take the mid-range game, and defenses just don't know how to defend it yet. Yeah, and I mean, it, 
an example, I guess, of that, of how they try and take it out of his hands would be, I mean, you saw it in the Orlando game a while back, but that in that one, Hardaway Jr. and uh, Burke were cooking so much, it, it didn't matter. But we saw it against Toronto where they would, you know, throw multiple guys at him, force the ball out of his hands. And he doesn't have the help around him right now to, to do that. So that's really the only thing that, that's working against uh, Luca right now because you saw, obviously, the Chicago game when he was given a little bit of that breathing room uh, just how he can carry this team, load him on his back. He's doing everything you could reasonably ask of a, a one player. And KP's looked pretty nice in his return back. He's been a little up and down in terms of some of the, the rust here and there, but that's to be expected. It's just basically a matter of trying to get the reserves back and trying to, and we talked about this being a, a theme for especially the second half of last year as well. This team just getting back and everyone getting back into the flow, health and everything allowing them to build a little bit of rhythm, which it doesn't feel like this team has really had an opportunity to do really since like the first half or even third of last year. seems like there's always been one or more key players out in and out of the lineup. Yeah. And I think the rhythm part is going to, is going to come in time. I think, you know, that's, that's something that, you know, whether you're talking about players with each other or players within themselves, because, you know, because, all these guys that have been out due to COVID protocol, you have to understand that like, you know, the same thing that you just said with, with KP, where you said, you know, to be expected mm -hmm. uh, as far as the rust and stuff. When, when you look at these guys that are going to start trickling back, they're also going to going to have some rust. And so now you can't just plug them back in and it's just a well-oiled machine again. Right. This is all going to take time. A lot of what, a lot of what I think this season is about is treading water and and just getting to a point where you know you're able you're you're in a good position for the stretch run and if you're able to do that the games are going to be close and and hey give the Mavericks credit there's been a couple of games this year where they've closed out close games that they didn't do last year um so that's a good thing as well um you know Luca has definitely developed as a leader as mm -hmm. well uh for him to dish out 15 assists and then come out and say that he was selfish like yeah. uh you know i think that's that's more or less him being the franchise quarterback of a team where you know they'll take the blame for when things go bad even when it's not really their fault um you know you just can't have wes Awandu, um missing wide open looks on the floor that's that's well first of all you just can't have him on the floor um and then if he is he can't be missing those, those shots and people like that. Right. So I yeah. think that's one of the biggest things that's been the issue. Yeah. It, the Mavericks have had to reach down the end of the bench and they've had to bring in their rookies for some key moments. And it, it's been very, it, it's been sort of a welcome to the NBA moment for, for the rookies. Their offensive game hasn't really been there yet. You still see flashes. Uh, the little bit of, we saw of Tyrell Terry, um, in that Bucks game, I was very encouraged by just some of the playmaking you saw, like the dish to Willie Cauley Stein in traffic and all of that. You see flashes of it here and there, but it, it hasn't all come together for them yet. And it's like, I, I think there's an, a knee jerk reaction here that happens with fans where given the minutes they're getting there, or particularly green is getting, they're looking at it and saying like, well, how has he not already started to figure this out yet? He, you know, we can't play him or it's not working out. Like it, it's a mid first round pick in his first like 15 NBA games to assume that he could be thrust into this role where he's having to play big minutes and just immediately, you know, hit the ground running is unreasonable. But even in the case of a, not a rookie, like a one do. Yeah. He's missing shots that you can't afford to have him miss in the previous two years. He was a 34, 35, I think maybe even 36% three point shooter. That's great. But he's still a guy that's a bottom of the rotation player. And when you're having to put him into the starting lineup and play him 30 minutes in a game, yeah, you're, you're already in a bad spot and you'd like to get more out of him. But to assume like that, it, that the problem is having him on the team and that it was a bad decision to bring him in. I think that's too knee jerk reactionary to just assume that everyone is on that same level of a, a starter. Exactly. I mean, I mean, I, I agree with you 100 percent. The, and the best example of this, it, uh, the, well, not the best, but the one that I most commonly use with with basketball fans is Quinn Cook, because remember, Quinn Cook 
was a Dallas Maverick and was just a nobody in those rebuild years before Luka. Mm -hmm. And then he goes to the Warriors where he's able to play a role that he's supposed that he's fit to play. Like it doesn't mean that he's a bad player and doesn't, doesn't, uh, does, doesn't belong on an NBA roster. It just means that this guy is a 10th, 10th player on the bench type guy. Um, and that's the role that he should be playing. And if you insert him into the starting lineup, you're not going to like what you see. And so, you know, we've seen that with Quinn Cook in Golden State. You see him now with the Lakers. Mm-hmm. He, like, where he is now is kind of where he belongs. Whereas in Dallas, he was playing heavy minutes. And he, not only was he a younger player, but even now, he just doesn't belong in that role. It doesn't mean that signing him was a mistake or bringing him in was a mistake. It just means that he wasn't used right because of the circumstances. Right. And that's just kind of what the case has been with a lot of these guys. Yeah, it's not a matter of talent evaluation. It's just the situation. When they signed him, they did not in- envision having to play him in this role, let alone this early in the year. So it- it's more a matter of that, but they're going to have to figure it out because I haven't seen a firm return date yet on like Richardson and Dorian Finney-Smith or Maxi. But the upcoming schedule, like I said, we're still in that really brutal stretch here. Carlisle called it a murderous week. They got the, the Pacers up next tomorrow. They have then the they're at San Antonio at Pacers and at San Antonio and then against Houston on Saturday. So you've got a tough block here that you still have to get through and you're going to be playing probably four players down. And even when they return, you can't count on it. The Mavericks offense hasn't been near the same this year, although Luca has shined and been brilliant. They have not been at the same level as last year and i think follow well said on the broadcast last uh the other night that their corner three-point shooting this year has like plunged down to like 30 percent, and that's that's not good man that that's that's supposed to be like an offense's bread and butter like the shortest range three-pointer you can take uh that you're supposed to be able to extend out and if you're in that situation i think that's going to hurt some of those wide open looks that you're able to generate if you just can't complete the play Right. And, but, but also, you know, you have to, you have to weigh in that, you know, when you talk about them struggling in the, uh, in, in the, in the corner three point shooting, they've missed Dorian Finney Smith, who was probably their best uh, corner three point shooter. Mm -hmm. He hasn't played in the last 12 days. I mean, the last last time he played was that, was that overtime game against, uh, against Denver. And so I think, you know, when you look at just the different factors in play, again, it goes back like, I, I'm kind of. I, I think you and I are kind of on the same page. Where I, I, I don't, I don't think this Mavericks team right now is necessarily a championship team. But I, I just, I, I just try to avoid the knee-jerk reactions here when they're dealing with COVID absences, beginning beginning of the season, and oh by the way, their Robin is just working his way back. Um, that, that that's another X factor that everyone has to like kind of keep in mind because we're so accustomed to seeing Luca take over games and dominate games. Don't forget that Luca can do that on a nightly basis. Mm -hmm. I don't think KP can, but when KP does, it's going to be a, it's going to be a beauty to watch. There is going to be games where he's just going to be unstoppable. And you can go back last year to that Houston game uh, where he scored, like, I think it was like 30, 35 plus points. and, And all of them were like, none of them were three point shots and he was just dominating. He's going to have games like that. Uh, He just has to work his way back into that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean that, I think that was a bubble game. The one you were referring to with KP there, but I mean, even earlier in the year when Luca was out for a stretch, you had the wins at Philadelphia and at Milwaukee. And that was just KP having to be the main guy essentially. And they were able to, to do that. So it's going to, yeah, it's going to take time for KP to work his way back in to get in any kind of consistent flow. He missed five months of action and the Mavericks, I think are going to be cautious about him. I haven't seen uh, a game where they've really used him uh, heavy minutes yet. I know he's touched 30 a couple times, like 29, 30 minutes, but I don't think he's gone over that. So they've been pretty protective of him, Like we envisioned that they would be, but if they can get any kind of rhythm with that, that'll help. And if they can just sustain any kind of uh, any kind of status on health as far as consistency, letting guys get in, letting them get the offense, kind of into somewhat of a rhythm, just having the same guys in there consistently and build on that, then I think the ceiling for this team is still very high. 
obviously with everything that is happening, I am a little bit less optimistic now of them making a, a hard push to home court advantage in a first round or anything like that. But at this point, I think the only team that would, to, that would scare me, assuming Dallas is healthy and, um, you know, has gotten a little bit of time to get a rhythm. I think the only team in the West that would really scare me would be the Lakers. Kind of like last year, we said that about the Clippers. Yeah. And I mean, look, the Mavericks are still, no matter what happens, no matter if they were, if they were doing everything that we expected them to do Mm -hmm. coming out of the off season, uh, this is still a team that is not, that is not built. I'm not saying they absolutely can't. I'm not going to put that past Rick Carlisle and Luca, but they're not built to beat the Lakers. They're not built to come out of the West and be in the NBA finals until they do get another uh, another superstar, which is all the more important when you have a guy like KP who you can't rely rely on to be out there every night. Mm-hmm. Um, you just have to have that third superstar, man. Like uh, until then, I think your ceiling is your your ceiling right now is probably just top four, uh, top four somewhere in the two to four range. Really, three or four for being really realistic. I feel like the I feel like the window. I don't think they're contender. Like I don't think in the same way like that they're a championship team yet. I think that they're kind of at that cusp of the, the window feels like it's starting to open now. And yeah, I think if obviously you get a third superstar that changes the equation. And I think that can put you over the top. I do think if you can build a cohesive team roster wise, top to bottom, then you can work with just the two you've got. If you have the health of Luca and KP, because the, the way Luca and KP were playing in the bubble last year, both basically averaging 30 and 10, if you have that plus a, a Mavericks team that can defend, like we've seen at times this year, and just the overall improvement in general, like that's a contender, even if you just have those two. So it, it's just a matter of getting the team, uh, you know, it, it, and you can't bank on health. You just hope for the best in that department because you never know what's going to happen. But if you have that, I think you can get there. But this team, regardless, they've got a ways to go before they get back to get any kind of rhythm. And hopefully they can they can start to find something cohesive because reactionary fan base is uh, sometimes the worst to deal with. People frustrated with Rick thinking that he's rolling out four all stars or something <laughs> as he loses to the Bulls and not working with a bunch of rookies and bottom of the bench guys. Yeah, let me let me just real quick. And I, I know we have to we have to wrap up soon, but I do I do just want to make a point that the Rick Carlisle slander is is just really ignorant mm-hmm. um you know i and, I and it really frustrates me because then i come uh, like I, whether i'm tweeting talking on radio shows or here on the podcast whatever it sounds like i'm some kind of like rick carlisle defender or homer it's just not the case i don't think rick carlisle is the perfect coach but if you think that the mavericks could do better than rick carlisle like i i advise you to stop smoking whatever you are because like it's just it's just not true rick carlisle is a top five coach in the nba he he's a guy that He's a guy that, you know, you if, if you're judging him by the first 10, 15 games of a season, then then you're just doing it wrong. I mean, yeah. you know, an example that I've used in the past is, is Bill Belichick. Uh, the Patriots would always lose one or two games in September and they'd be they'd be two and two or something like that. And everyone would be like, oh, is this the end of the Patriots dynasty? And then they just go on and win the Super Bowl. And that's just. That, you know, because right now Rick Carlisle is trying a bunch of different combinations. Forget the COVID, uh, the, the COVID absences. Beyond that, he's just trying a bunch of rotation pieces. He'll get it to work, and the stretch run is where you really decide uh, how he's doing. Yeah, a- absolutely. And you know, the the kind of recent thing that I think obviously people are reacting to every loss right now. But Friday night when they had the, the whole thing about the timeout and Luca appearing to disagree with that on the court uh, before the KP ugly bricked three, like Luca said it after the game as well, but like, it's a good look. If it goes in, yeah. we're not talking about it. Twice. Yeah. Twice. I mean, look. Burke had a good look, which was the right play from Luca to get him that, uh, get him the ball there. And then they get another crack at it. I understand maybe questioning that, but I do think, you know, the Bucks are a very good half court defensive team taking a timeout and inbounding, not necessarily ideal, not to get into the specific uh, specifics of all that again, but the point being like, as much as people want to complain, 
having a defense on its heels like that and scrambling, and then you still get a quality look from an incredibly capable three point shooter, even at that distance. How many logo shots have we seen from KP? Like you have to, you have to ask yourself what would what would you do if you weren't just looking at hindsight, right? And I'll make right. a I'll make one more cross board comparison. Andy Reid goes for it on fourth and one with Chad Henney, um, and and he and he converts here in the AFC divisional round of the playoffs last weekend. Mm-hmm. What if he doesn't make it? I mean, are are you killing him now? Um, but this is who Andy Reid is. He goes for these things. It was it was a good dis- it, like, you know, I, I I'll say it right now. I would have disagreed with that play call whether he makes it or not. I probably would have done like a quarterback sneak or something, right? But right. but but I'm not gonna kill the guy for doing something that that logically at the time just just happened to make sense. Look, if KP's shot goes in, everyone's raving about how Rick Carlisle just let his team play it out didn't call the timeout didn't stop the momentum that's just the that's just the way sports go sometimes yeah exactly so i'm not worried about the rick angle i I think it's still overblown and yeah we we see these moments early in the year where he's tinkering with stuff whether it's rotation whether it's how he wants to stack guys minutes or whatever and it usually rounds into form and we we have less of that frustration as the season goes on because he finds what works and then he starts to implement that but Regardless, the team's got to do something here soon because, yeah, it's, it's not getting any easier just yet. Help's on the way, but you can't take on too much more water uh, with how stacked the West is and everything. So six and seven, the left turn it around Wednesday night at Indiana, six o'clock. That'll be fun, although Oladipo's gone. So I'm curious to see what Indiana looks like now. I have not caught one of their games since that trade. but And I think I did see Miles Turner is expected to play now. Mm-hmm. So that also changes the equation a little bit, but so thank you for coming on. Always a pleasure to talk Mavericks with you. Uh, we'll have to do it again sometime and uh, we'll get something scheduled here soon. Awesome. Sounds good, man. Always a pleasure to be on with you. Appreciate it. All right. Well, don't forget to like this video, drop a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas prospect. And until next time, remember every legend was once a prospect. Peace.